uh, discussion here in the round. Uh, and I'm going to uh, ask, uh, please, His Excellency Fuad Senora to come and join His Excellency Mazru Ali for this panel session. Uh, and I'd also like to invite the other three panel members, the Right Honourable Lord Howell of Guildford, former U UK Secretary of Energy, please, to join. Your Excellency, if you'd like to take a seat here. Lord Howell, please. Thank you very much. Uh, and joining the gentleman is Mr. Zhu Jiaojie, advisor to the National Energy Administration in China, and Mr. Ali Khideri, the chairman and CEO of Dragoman Partners. Uh, and to moderate uh, this discussion, it's my pleasure to invite John Defterios, the anchor at CNN, to join us here on the floor. Where is he? He's behind right me, right there. <laughs> Over to you, John. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be back, Prime Minister. Um, I was thinking when we had the conversation uh, with the energy minister that Diallo was conducting, if we had this discussion about energy security back in the first quarter of 2008, it would have been very, very different. It was the march to $100 a barrel. We went to $147 a barrel in July 2008, saw a collapse in prices in the second half of that year. And then we fast forward to the first quarter of 2009 and President Barack Obama taking the oath of office and a promise to reduce the dependency on Middle East suppliers, suppliers from Latin America like Venezuela, uh, and do something about the fact that we had an over-dependency in America on imports. $100 oil was here to stay. It averaged that price uh, until the first half of 2014, and we saw what's happened in the second half of 2014 how things have changed. The U.S. shale revolution, discoveries that we're going to find here in East Africa and Argentina, and all the while, as the Prime Minister suggested in his opening remarks today, we've had disruption in the market with the Arab Spring, supplies from Libya under threat. Let's not forget the attack against Algerian gas supplies uh, in 2014, the question mark of Boko Haram, which will affect Nigeria going forward, and perhaps supplies coming out of there. There was a risk premium in the market that I've been reporting about of 10 to 15% built into crude. At below $50 a barrel, no one would suggest that there's a risk premium built in today. In fact, Christoph brought up the fact that we're discounting the risk premium uh, in the market today. So it's not a supply security equation all of a sudden in 2015, but there is an investment security equation going forward. Who's going to invest in the future, particularly in North America with prices hovering $50, $60 a barrel, the prognosis that we saw here that you voted on for the next three to four years and the average that you're suggesting. So an investment security question coming forward here, demand security forward uh, suggestion coming forward, and let's not forget after what we've seen with Sony Entertainment over the last uh, 60 days, there's the question of cybersecurity that could potentially affect uh, this market as well. Oftentimes when we lower our guard, when there's another issue on the table, like lower prices, uh, perhaps the industry is not honed in on that potential threat of cybersecurity. A lot to talk about in our 45 minutes together, just so you know what to plan for. We'll have a discussion here for 30 minutes. We'll take polls from the floor as well, as Sean did in our, our first session with Christoph. Have your, uh, your voting devices ready, because I'll intersperse those in our conversation. And I want to allow at least 10 minutes to come to you uh, to pepper our panel. Uh, Diala kindly introduced everybody. It's a star-studded cast, so I don't need to reintroduce anybody. Before we jump into the debate, we've heard from uh, the minister his thoughts on the industry very quickly, so I can go to the panel very quickly. Uh, minister, what are your thoughts about how you define energy security with the price changes we've seen from June 2014 uh, to January 2015 today? Have we changed the debate about energy security and what it really is defined at today, whether it's supply security or investment security because of the uncertainty of demand security in your view? I think the supply and demand security would require a, a, a reasonable price, let's put it this way. And that reasonable price is going to judge uh, if, I mean, the emphasis on, on the, the supply security or the demand security that a single country would require. Let me explain it a little bit. Uh, if the, uh, under the lower oil prices, we will have a supply issue because it does not make sense to invest and that may take time, but we will see it. 
if the price is too high, again, we will have a competition, an oversupply and, and competition uh, like what we've seen in the, in the previous four years. And technology and investments will be uh, focused to bring more crude into the market. Now, we have seen both the, the higher and the lower. And I think now we are seeking the balance between the two. I don't think it's an issue today of the amount of supply that we can put in the market. We know that there is a potential for the shale oil to grow further. We know that there is a potential for other countries to develop or to come back to normal, to no normal production like Libya, Iran, and, uh, and the growth in Iraq. So supply is not going to be the issue as long as the, the, uh, the price is, is right. If the price is not right, then we will have a supply issue and the prices will be, will be shooted. And even if they do go high, the supply, the supply from the market will come, like, okay. like Christoph mentioned. I'll circle back with you because I'm going to get uh, the impressions of the, the panel and then the impressions from the audience on the floor. And then I want to uh, drill down a little bit more about what you were suggesting here. What is the price is right? It's not the game show. Uh, from the United States has been emulated in different parts of the world, but something that's real today that's affecting the investments that we see in this region and uh, throughout the world as well. Ali, I think it's a very good time to, to bring you forward here on the fact that we're on the cusp of something quite grand in the energy business, if you think about it. Uh, Iran, if the sanctions are lifted over the next six months, could be a major player. I interviewed after the OPEC meeting uh, in November, the Iranian energy minister suggested in three months we can get to almost four million barrels a day. Within a year, they can get to four and a half million barrels a day. We know what's happening in Iraq right now. Uh, at $50, $60 a barrel that our audience was suggesting, this has to be a real shot across the bow to the emerging players who've based their budgets on around $100, if not more, per barrel. This is going to be very painful. I absolutely think it going to be uh, a bit painful in that, uh, as you suggested, if sanctions against Iran are lifted, you have an additional million or more barrels potentially on the market. Iraq has very aggressive designs after decades of misrule under Saddam Hussein and Nouri al-Maliki. Now with sort of a more or less national unity government in Baghdad with a deal brokered recently between Baghdad and the Kurdistan region, uh, a quarter million barrels a day of Kurdish crude is now on the market. The Kirkuk exports via the Northern Pipeline uh, have, been, have been reintroduced. The thing that concerns me, though, is what you began by discussing, which is the, the fact that I think the markets are not factoring in the geopolitical risk that we've seen, since, namely since 2011, the beginning of the regional turbulence. Libya is facing a full-scale civil war. I think that is now beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, Yemen is disintegrating before our very eyes and hasn't actually been for quite some time for those of us who have been visiting Yemen. Uh, Syria is obviously imploding. And frankly, uh, I don't think one should discount the situation in Iraq in that while the coalition is now involved, again, Iraq faces a full-scale, not only insurgency, but more or less of a, of a civil war. And, and the violence uh, levels really take us back to the pre-surge highs of, of the ethno-sectarian conflict there. The reality, though, of, of the introduction of North uh, American unconventional production, both in shale and in, for example, Canadian tar sands, is though that you've introduced millions of barrels of new production onto the market, four million new barrels in the case of the United States. This is excellency the minister uh, indicated. So the, what we are facing globally, and, and this is sort of basic college economics, economics 101 here, the market will stabilize where uh, demand and supply meet in that what, is, what are the global markets willing to pay and what can producers uh, live with. Obviously, in the case of Russia or Algeria or Libya or Iran or Iraq, all of these players uh, have fiscal break-even prices of a, at above $100 a barrel. In the case of, of, of Algeria, it's much higher. I think it's closer to $150. Um, on the margins of the recent OAPEC meeting, I spent uh, some, some time alone with my old friend, the Iraqi oil minister, Adil Abdel Mahdi, who was previously finance minister under our friend Ayad Alawi in uh, 2004. 
he shared with me a shocking statistic. In Iraq, for example, the government's payrolls were 850,000 under the Alawi government in 2004. Today, they're three and a half million because that system in Iraq since 2003 is purely a patronage-based system. So what you're facing here, in addition to the dynamics in the industry, which are very fundamental, and it's a trillion dollar uh, issue across the planet, but for these producers themselves, they are looking at uh, regime survival here. For the Iranians, the Iraqis, with the ruble collapse in Russia, uh, what they are facing is deep pain from a government perspective, which threatens regime survival because it very soon, if these prices remain this low, uh, you will have social instability in these countries. And I think as His Excellency uh, knows all too well, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia have deep fiscal uh, have reserves and sovereign wealth funds. Countries like Iraq, Iran, and to a certain extent Russia don't have those, uh, those reserves. So the situation we're facing globally and geopolitically I think is being discounted by the market and I think that would be a, a very serious mistake moving forward. It leads me to the, the former Prime Minister of Lebanon, Mr. Sionora. Um, that's not such a great Saudi authored strategy within OPEC then to put incredible pressure on Iraq, Iran, Libya, Algeria during the transition of the Arab Spring. Would you suggest that was the right strategy in November to lead a charge, to lead production, to build up, to have excess supplies, to bring oil down to $50 a barrel in a period of time when these people are in a period of transition? Well, <clears throat> I think that the, the motives of uh, Saudi Arabia in this respect is not strictly a political motive alone. It's, it's not a political motive, but let's be very clear here. Yeah. It's not a political motive, and you live in a neighborhood that's gone through major upheaval since 2011. Yeah. One would argue this is not the time to test everybody on the downside to maintain market share. What do you, what do you think? Well, you see, uh, in, in, in this situation of changes that are taking place, how long you are going to keep uh, countries unaware of the changes that are taking place and that they really need to adapt to changes. And in this, in this regard, uh, the, the, the pro probably that what really happened is going to affect most of these countries. And particularly, I want to add, I want to, add to this, is that many of these countries, whether the Iranians or the Iraqis, are not going to really be able to increase production as much as they really hope for because this is going to require a great deal of investments in, in Iran and in Iraq in order to really increase production. So what is, what is going to happen definitely, it's, it's going to really carry with it great risks politically and socially within these countries uh, in, in that, that most of their budgets is based on much higher level of price for, for oil, and how to adapt to these changes uh, requires very bold decisions. So this is definitely is going to carry with it great risks uh, politically within the region. And uh, th this, in fact, uh, in fact uh, would have to really, uh, each of these countries, try to come to their senses and see how to really adjust and adapt this expansive policy, whether in terms of expenditures or intervention politically within the region, is going to really uh, be uh, unsustainable. And on hence, the budget side, you're suggesting the, the patronage side. that um, sure, Secretary was sure, talking about? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, and, uh, because uh, definitely in the case of Iran, there is a great level of expenditures that are taking place because uh, Iran is stretching itself too thin in its intervention policy within the region. As you know, they are really, uh, from time to time, boasting and saying that we are, uh, have, well, we have an influence over four Arab capitals. So this situation definitely, uh, uh, from, from the aspect of inability to really increase production as much as they really want. And secondly, with their expensive uh, let's say, policy of uh, in increasing expenditures uh, within, within uh, Iran or outside Iran because of their intervention. So this is going to really carry with it 
uh, let's say, changes, and that would require uh, a, a change in policy. Otherwise, it is unsustainable. Okay, very quickly, on, on the follow-up, you kind of avoided the, the Saudi equation here. No. Um, was it the right time after the Arab Spring and what we see in Libya today and in Yemen, as Ali was suggesting here, to be testing the downside for these countries in a period of transition? And this, this situation is not only brought uh, in, uh, into being because of political motives. One has to get back to the basics that this is because of a change in the, in the overall supply and demand, uh, uh, let's say, situations. Mm. Uh, I, think, I think with, the, with this change in, in the economics of uh, producing alternative sources of energy, that would not have been possible for the oil producing countries to stay, let's say, uh, as they are and watching that their market share is declining rapidly as much as uh, we would have seen the situation. So this is the situation I think that they were really uh, uh, obliged to, to, to resort to this, to this policy. Very good. Thank you very much for answering the question. Lord Hal, and then I'm going to come to uh, uh, Mr. Xi here. Um, Mr. Zhu, sorry. Uh, let's go to the, uh, the sphere of uh, Norway and the UK here. What does 50 to $70 do to energy policy uh, going forward in terms of additional exploration, getting efficiencies, going uh -huh. after the pot potential shale market, which has been great resistance by the European public, as you know. Uh, you can even add in the wild card of Russia, which is a, a huge question, but let's cover that in a follow-up. Well, what does right, it do to the, future exploration? I mean, yeah, first of all, obviously, it depends on how long it lasts. We're, we're going to talk about that more. But um, I'd, I'd like to really start from the other point you mentioned, which is not oversupply so much as demand insecurity uh, in the European region. I mean, uh, Mr. Signora talked about unknowns in this, uh, uncertainties in this region. We've got a lot of unknowns in Europe as well. To, to be rather local from where I come from, we don't know who the hell is going to win the next general election in uh, Britain. Uh, we don't really know, although we hope that the United Kingdom is going to stay united. We don't know what's going to happen in the Eurozone. It's just about to hit another bout of sickness. Uh, we don't even know how the European Union, which is a 20th century model, is going to adjust to the digital age. And we don't know, since you've mentioned Russia, uh, where Mr. Putin is going to take Russia next. These are huge unknowns, and they have a direct impact on uh, the pattern of demand uh, and uh, where we're looking for future supplies uh, in Europe. So that's, uh, t that's in the background, and I think it adds up, adds up to a fact that our present uh, recovery in Europe has been rapid in Britain, but it hasn't been so rapid in the rest of continental Europe, is going to continue very slow indeed, mm. uh, with a lot of uncertainty, and um, where we have signs of growth, we have to be realistic. It's fed by steroids, it's fed by QE, uh, it's fed by uh, abnormally low interest rates, and these things don't last. So in the background, we've got the possibility of very slow recovery in Europe, and that means slow recovery in, in demand for energy. Uh, on top of that, there is, uh, we haven't heard much this morning about the uh, increase in uh, the t impact of technology on demand. Technology is going to increase supply. It's doing so yes. all around, we can see. It's going to technology is going to reduce or flatten demand. It's flat anyway. It has been for many years in, for oil in America and in uh, Europe. Uh, we are, uh, I'm not saying that the green revolution is going to make huge inroads, but it, energy efficiency is increasing at dramatic rates. It's interesting you bring that up. Uh, yeah, yeah, OPEC suggesting rate. between now and 2040, Lord Howe, that you will see a 60% increase in demand for fossil fuels between now and 2040. Well, 40. That, you think that's not going to be very realistic? Maybe. I don't think that's realistic. I think there's a lot of wishful thinking in this area, understandable wishful thinking. People think, oh, uh, recovery will come and demand will increase. I mean, first of all, small, well, big things in the background. Uh, Japan has no intention of increasing. On the contrary, Japan, it, now Shinzo Abe's got his majority back, very adept politician um, this time around. <laughs> He's, uh, uh, Japan is going to get some nuclear capacity going again, 
the, power, the investment's there. They've just got to get the machinery going again. Not as high as it was before, but about half their nuclear station. They're gonna, they've got the contract uh, with uh, UAE and others for, for gas, but they're not going to increase on this. They're going to be cutting down on uh, gas from Australia. They're going to be cutting down on their coal imports, which are even that they're going to certainly be cutting down on their oil imports. So there's demands going down from that side. Then China, everyone's gone around saying, oh, it's all right. In the end, China's going to get back on high growth and it's going to be a fantastic uh, thirst for oil and gas. I, I would long to hear from the Chinese <laughs> experts. I don't think that is so. I think the Chinese people have a very clear view that they want a different pattern of modernization. They're talking about enough. They're talking about we don't want to go through the Western uh, gas guzzling greed. We're not going through that phase. Chinese, China is going to develop, I believe, in a much more moderate energy way. And therefore, the future there is that it's always going to have so much thirst it will keep the oil price up is, I think, a bit of an illusion. Okay, I'll come back to you, of yeah, course. There's a yeah, lot to... Yeah. I want to focus on my next remarks to you on, on Russia. Uh, you're probably, I was going to use the analogy, of the most <laughs> attractive girl in high school that every guy wants a date because <laughs> the big battle is for Asia. You know, the UAE is making sure they're competitive with the pricing. Saudi Arabia is doing the same thing. Vladimir Putin before he held his version of Davos in June 2014, signs a 30-year contract for oil and gas. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, we're in a very different environment, $50 and below. This is the best thing that could happen to China. It's like the elixir for uh, the, the G2 economy uh, of the world. How do you play it now? Do you go, as Lord Howe suggested, forcefully going into alternative energy sources? It's a buyer's market. You can lock in these contracts for as long as possible. What's in the cards for 2015 and beyond, do you think, in pricing, and what does it do to the economy? I think currently the low oil price is seemingly a good thing for China as a you know, major oil consumers. But also, for me, it is not a totally good thing as well. There is a huge challenge for China as well. Uh, low price is good for consumer, but also we have facing lots of challenges. As, as well, you know, we have to deal with. When the oil price is coming down, we also think about uh, some projects we are working on, like the coal, you know, renewables, and other type, the projects we are working on, you know, how to uh, uh, continue to our strategies for the coal, cheap coal, and the other type of uh, project like the coal to gas, you know, that is facing the huge challenges, you know because the oil price is going down. So the low, uh, low oil price is seemingly the good thing for China, but uh, it, it not, uh, in fact, it's not. We have to think about the new realities we are facing now. You know. Low price is the first black swan you know, into the new year, you know, we are thinking. But also we have seen uh, what's going on into the future, internally and externally as well. Externally, we simply put, you know, may very easily to understood, you know, we very heavily depend on the falling oil and the gas, you know, oil falling dependence will be increased from now, you know, almost close to 60%, probably will be increased to 70% in around the year 2020. And natural gas dependence will be increased from the 30%, will be increased to 40% will be. So this is a huge issue, and uh, also many issues internal as well. You know, now we have to uh, manage our demand side well. You know, demand side in China now will be, I believe, a little bit slow down, but the general speed will be increased. Not fast as some organization uh, forecast, like IEA, you know. Our forecast for Chinese demand will be much lower than that, but the uh, general change will be increased at uh, one, between one and two percent will be increased. This will be a, a, a present a major change for, for, for China. And domestically, uh, your demand is going to go up one to two percent a year, you think? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. I think yeah. may interrupt you here for a second because we're going to be fairly tight on time with the answers. Um, a, a few years ago, I did a story on Goldilocks oil. Uh, not too hot, not too cold, but something that's a, a good level to keep demand going. I had an interview with Ali Al Naimi, the uh, energy minister of Saudi Arabia in 2012, and he declared that Goldilocks oil was $100 a barrel. Uh, 
I'm sure the investment scenario at $45 to $50 is not fantastic. Uh, do you want to tackle that one, Minister? And Ali Kaderi, what is Goldilocks oil today? If it's not 100, as the uh, energy minister of Saudi Arabia was suggesting in 2012, what is the right balance to keep investment in play, market share for different players? Is it 70 Goldilocks oil, $80 a barrel Goldilocks oil? I'm not, too, I'm not going, to, John, to give you a price, but I would suggest something. We all know that the shale oil producers are very important and, and for, for, all, for the, the market supply, and we all need them to stay. Wow. So if that is the case, since they are producing almost 4 million today, I think whatever price that makes the shale oil continue to, produce, to be produced is going to be the fair price for the conventional producers to produce. So whether it being 60, 70, 80, whatever that, that figure is, I think that's, going, that's where the market will stabilize. And I, I said this probably uh, one year ago in Paris, where I said, if there is an issue, the NOCs and OPEC, they're going to sit in the back and someone else needs to make a decision on what is the right price for us to produce. And that new someone is going to be the shale oil producers because of their contribution, growing contribution in the next four to five years. Interesting. Okay, very good. Everybody grab your clickers quickly. We'll go to the, the first question and then I want to pepper some questions to the minister uh, right thereafter to pick up on our conversation. Uh, question number one in this uh, energy security uh, panel. Does everybody have their clickers handy? Uh, fairly straightforward. Which is a greater challenge to planning for global energy security through 2020? We heard from our panel. We'd love to hear from you. Is it demand uncertainty or supply uncertainty? Which is the great, greater challenge to planning for global energy security through 2020? Demand uncertainty or supply uncertainty? Let's get that sound back up. I like that, Sean. You added addition to Gulf Intelligence. Aha. Uh -huh. So there's plenty of supply around, but we don't know what the demand uh, equation is going to be. Demand's a problem. Pick it up, Lord Hal. Go ahead. Because uh, I, I, if the engine of Europe's only growing 0.1%, and that's Germany. The, the Greeks may be running for the hills pretty soon after the election on the 25th. It doesn't point to great demand from Europe, and it puts so much burden on China, <laughs> South Korea, and Japan, doesn't it? Yeah, go ahead. And I think, I mean, there's, there's two slices to this argument. There's demand insecurity because of res continuing recession. And as we said earlier, that the, the recovery in the West certainly is fed on steroids, and that can stop. But there's medium and longer term demand insecurity that technology is racing ahead. And both in China and rising Asia, and in Europe and in America, people are, the energy intensity is reducing dramatically. Energy efficiency is increasing dramatically. Let me give you really micro examples, two micro examples to bring home this point. Uh, in the UK, uh, petrol, refined petroleum, has dropped by about a third of the pump for the consumer in the last three months. It's had absolutely no effect on increased demand. People have got used to the fact that they want a, a, a motor car that does 20 to 25 miles to the litre or 80 or 90 miles to the gallon, compared with 20 a few years ago. They're not going to go back to gas guzzlers as in the 1980s we did. The world went back after the oil. It's not going to happen this time. Um, the uh, heating bills, and in the UK, a lot of houses are still heated, especially in the countryside by oil, have dropped by a third. This is extra money in the pockets. It's not going to be spent on uh, more heating. It's not going to be spent on more energy. The pattern has changed. And on top of that, we've had, as someone was saying to me this morning, uh, uh, your, you know, the price of, a, of solar energy is now coming down to competitive rates with uh, fossil fuels. Um, on top of that, we haven't mentioned coal this morning, but the odd contrary fact is that for all the efforts of the Greens and the energy transformation, we're now burning more coal than ever. Europe is awash with, with coal. Germany is going back to lignite. Uh, uh, India is developing more coal. The coal story is still 
got to go through its full length. So it doesn't surprise me that demand insecurity, which is revenue insecurity, which we all dislike, but it's what, uh, what may happen, and it's what the investor hates, but it may happen, is probably the prominent thing. I'm not at all surprised with this result. Very good to hear. Uh, if I can come back to you, Mr. Zhu, about uh, the pricing we see as a result of this demand uncertainty today. Uh, Qatar has some 54 trains or super tankers kind of carting around the world, bring, delivering that LNG or the gas to, uh, to liquids technology. It's had very generous pricing over the last few years. Uh, indexed to oil and that $100 average we've seen today. Will China, Japan, South Korea, you can't speak for them, but will China be more demanding and suggest, look, we have to break this link to the index and you should bring your prices down. We're living in a new reality and this could have quite a, a sharp impact on Qatar going forward. Do you think that's going to be the outcome? I think for China, especially if we talk about natural gas in, uh, in form of ANG now, you know, uh, we really, something we are facing now is not the existing price, you know, in Asia. That price in Asia is very much, you know, island country, you know, like uh, uh, Japan and South Korea. Uh, some price for natural gas we wanted now is not uh, certain yet, you know. In China, I think in the, year, in the future, like in the year around 2020, the price, the natural gas price, will be much lower than the current price, you know, simply because we're facing multiple supplies around the world, not only NG from the Qatar. You know, this is only one source we are very, you know, are really known to all everybody. But also we have, you know, multiple sources, you know, secure already from Central Asia, Turkmenistan by pipeline and uh, Russia. And also we have uh, much more, you know, uh, NG supply will be available from, from America, from, uh, from Canada, from Australia, even uh, from uh, 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 Africa, for example. So I believe the future price uh, in Asia will be much lower, and China market will be play a big role in making such a price. Okay, I want to go to the minister in just a moment, but Ali Kaderi, why don't you weigh in with what Lord Howe was suggesting here with this demand uncertainty. China's going to be asking for lower gas prices going forward. That doesn't affect you too much, but we'll get to oil in a second. Uh, this is going to be not great news for the emerging energy powers of Iran, Iraq, Libya in transition, very painful. Algeria, perhaps, in transition at leadership with the health, uh, the health of Mr. Bouteflika. This is going to be a rough time in the broader Middle East, is it not, with what we're talking about here about energy security? Well, just going back to the issue of demand, I think that um, while globally uh, demand patterns have fundamentally changed, particularly in Europe because energy prices have always been so much more expensive, uh, I think in the United States that necessarily doesn't apply in the sense that while Americans, generally speaking over the past decade, have gone to using uh, more efficient cars, you're seeing an immediate effect now with oil plunging again. Americans are buying four by fours again, they're buying SUVs again, they're reverting to their usual pattern. You know, it's We're not well long-term thinkers when it comes to consumption. Well, That's consumption, good. you know, if, if you're paying right. uh, half of what you did uh, or, or a third less of what you did a year ago for oil or for gasoline at the pump, that money uh, tends to be spent in other parts of the economy, as was discussed. There's also an important uh, issue to discuss here, which is that in the United States, as we know, West Texas Intermediate has, had a, has always been markedly lower than Brent crude. And that's actually especially the case for the spot uh, price of natural gas. In the United States, natural gas is now below $3 a BTU. It's about $280, $290. In some parts of Asia, they're paying above $15 a BTU. And see, so what that's created is it's created a fundamental difference a, a, and a, a fundamental tailwind for the American economy and a fundamental headwind for its competitors. That's why, for example, BMW is opening its largest factory in the world, to include Germany. It's opening the largest factory in the world in the United States now. Because even with relatively high labor prices in the United States, it's paying half of what it is in Europe for, for energy, and it's paying probably a quarter of, its pay, of what it pays in, in Asia for energy. On, with regards to regional geopolitics, um, 
I agree with, with His Excellency, Mr. Senora, that, that I think that, the, and, and His Excellency the Minister would know better than me, but I think that for Saudi Arabia and the other Gulf Arab producers, the fundamental decision recently to maintain production is fundamentally grounded in economics and trying to maintain market share. I don't believe that it was a politically based decision. Um, although there are some within various palaces around the region that I, I'm quite certain are, are very happy to see the Iranians and the Iraqis uh, and their Russian patrons suffer after the genocide that Iran and Iraq and Hezbollah have inflicted uh, on the people of Syria uh, or Iraq uh, over the past several years. The, the concern I have, though, is frankly, um, we've seen uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, the Iraqi Shia Islamist militias, their allies in Syria, their allies in Lebanese Hezbollah, and their, again, their global patron Russia. These are very ruthless actors, uh, and they have retaliated for much smaller perceived slights against domestic political, political opponents or uh, regional uh, rivals. I'm actually quite concerned that we may see a black swan event uh, if prices remain low in the form of an asymmetric or irregular warfare attack on, on Gulf infrastructure or, frankly, cyber. Uh, the Russians' capabilities are, are quite well known to us who, who follow this, uh, this area. Um, you've seen you know, a small country with a small fraction of Russia's capabilities, North Korea, has dealt a devastating attack to Sony Pictures in the United States. And the United States, for all of its tremendous global capabilities, was unable to stop it in advance, was only able to pinpoint it after the fact. Um, I think the combination of regional radicalization, and this is where I fundamentally disagree with, uh, uh, respectfully disagree with Mr. Senora, I actually don't think the issue, issue of Israel-Palestine today is a primary factor for regional instability. I think it's poor governance that is, a, that is the primary factor. And I think the best indicator of that, or the best model, is the United Arab Emirates. Thanks to Sheikh Zayed and, and the other leaders of the United Arab Emirates who have diversified their economy, who have integrated uh, their population, who, generally speaking, have exceptional governance, um, you see in the UAE there's very, very little, little, almost no radicalization. In the rest of the region, the failed states that you mentioned, Libya, Egypt to a certain extent under Mubarak, Yemen certainly, uh, Iraq certainly, Leb uh, Syria, uh, and Afghanistan, Pakistan, you've seen tremendous radicalization because of the poor governance. The problem that we face is not only the, the poor governance remains in these countries, so the fundamental driver of ISIS or Al-Qaeda is still there. But now with the reduction of oil prices, again in places like Iraq or, uh, or Algeria or Yemen or Iran, I'm, I'm afraid that the reduced economic opportunities for these millions, tens of millions of young mm -hmm. men and women is going to further radicalize these populations and come back to haunt these fundamentally market-driven uh, policies of, of keeping oil low for a sustained period. Thank you for uh, answering the question very directly. I promise to come back to the, to the minister with a couple of key questions in the context of what we've talked about today. Let me excuse the rest of my panel here for having my back to you for a couple of minutes. Uh, I don't mean to be rude, but we're in the round. Uh, in light of what uh, Mr. Kaderi said, uh, minister, uh, it's nearly two months into the decision by OPEC to leave production where it is. Uh, do you look back and suggest this was still the right decision. This is going to be the correct path for 2015. Oh, yes, I'm confident. And I think you, you need to look at this is a unified decision. This is not a decision driven by one country. We discussed the rationale of the decision, and we discussed the reasons for, for us not to, we, not to react to something that we did not create. Those who created this oversupply, they need to learn the lesson, as we mentioned, and adapt to stabilizing the market because they are not the small players anymore. Soon there will be only the shale oil, despite the other production. In 2020, there will be an 8 million barrels produced. So alone, the shale oil will be as big as Saudi Arabia. So if they don't behave rationally as a group, and I know how difficult it is, to make them act rationally as a group, you cannot expect 
one country to do it. The other challenge that we have within the group is what you mentioned. We have countries that aspire to go back to their production. If the quota that we protected as OPEC reduces, the challenge is going to be even further. It's not the fact that UAE want to maintain a certain share alone. It's the OPEC share that we want in the international market that we want to, to, to protect. And that share by 2020 will be reduced naturally because it does not grow. It just stays the same and the world uh, demand uh, on oil grows. For the collective good of OPEC, is it the right decision though for countries like Iran and Iraq and Algeria to go through this much pain in the near term? Well, John, you need to look at it and go back to 2008. What do we do and did in 2008? We reduced by 4.2 million barrels. If you reduce a million, a 500, the glut today in the market is about 2 million. So even if you reduce, I'm sure someone will take that advantage and, and produce it, and then you will be in the problem again. So that decision, if it was a reduction, I would be, if we took such a decision, I think we will be, uh, we will be uh, regretting today because we will not see an impact. And you are better off leave the market to stabilize. It's good, it's good for the consumers in your countries. It's good for the world economy. It's good for China. And I think the reaction, the reaction will need time. Those giant economies, China is not going to drop everything that they have done and change suddenly to something else because the price for six months dropped to 50. It will take time. If that stable price is, let's say, $80, I am sure China will have a higher chance of growth. And the hydrocarbon is going to be, or 70 or whatever the price is. And the attractiveness of hydrocarbon is going to be much more than it was on under $100. And that will drive more demand, that will drive more growth in the economy. And I think that's what China and India and other great nations are puzzled with. Do they change? Is it now? Or do they wait another few months to see if this is going to last longer and make a decision? Uh, you saw the latest reports from Blackstone and Goldman Sachs suggesting that it's going to be a range of 46 to $40 a barrel in the first half of 2015. What, what do you make of these latest reports? I don't believe uh, any of those because I have seen the same telling us when uh, in 2007, 2008, is going to be 200 by now. So I think we need to go back to what His Excellency mentioned. Go back to the basics. Does it make sense to produce at the current prices for all of the producers? I think the answer is obvious. Now, is this drop in the prices justified to drop like this in this, uh, in this short term? No. So if you go back, the, the, the demand on, uh, on oil at $50, is it going to be the same demand uh, growth, I mean demand growth on oil at $50 or $70? Is it going to be the same as if it's at 100 I think even in Europe, we have seen countries like Germany shifting to coal for economical reason, not for environmental reason. And I am sure they will shift back to a hydrocarbon if the price is right. So I think, I think that is going to be, that's the fundamental rules of the market that we will see, but we need just to wait for it to happen. I'm listening to you very carefully here. The new normal sounds like $70 a barrel where the UAE is comfortable at. I told you, I, I'm, I, I, no one in this region can dictate that price anymore and take that for me. No one from this region can dictate and interested to dictate that price anymore. We are not in the 70s or 80s anymore. We are an open economies and we are, uh, we are looking and working with, uh, with the great economies like China and others as, as, as uh, a responsible producers. Who is going to dictate the price? I think it's the lowest who are should be, who should be a swing producer, by the way. 
those highest cost producers, they always need to be on the top. And I think it's what Christoph mentioned, is going to be switching on and switching off of those shale oil producers. They will produce when it's economically viable for them to produce, and they will shut off those wells when it does not make sense. And that is going to be the stabilized price that you will see. And no one can tell you if it's 80 or 85 or 70 or whatever is that price. We will produce always as long as it makes sense for us to produce. And if it's higher than the cost of production, we will stop. Okay, final point, which I didn't get a chance to bring. Is, is the new battleground really Asia today? Uh, we've seen the price cutting, Russia's entering in that market. Is this the new battleground really is uh, securing your customers in Asia and this is what it's all about? I think we are forgetting an, a whole continent called Africa here in this discussion. If you look at the growth in certain countries in Africa, and China is a prominent investor there, whether from hydrocarbon or whether from other, uh, other sources, Africa, I think, at lower oil prices will wake up and will grow. Asia and, and is, is going to be stay uh, as, as a major uh, demand, demand source. Everyone is focusing on Asia. But I think even the Asians, especially China and India, they are now focusing on Africa and investing in Africa, and they are smart. They foresee that the growth is going to be in Africa. So the, the, uh, the world, I think, supply is going to be on, on hydrocarbon. I don't see it uh, softening in the long run, yes, in the short term, but in the long run, I think it will be there. Uh, there is a, a limit to the growth in production from the, from the shale oil, 2020, 2025, whatever that number is, and then they'll start declining, and OPEC need to be, uh, OPEC and others, of course, they need to supplement that, that growth. Uh, technology will, uh, will, will help us, of course, but uh, what is the price? The price is always going to be what is fair for those who are, who are uh, the most expensive producers. Great, thank you for being so uh, direct with the questions. Let's bring up the next uh, voting question here. And John, just a quick, this will probably be our last question. Yeah, absolutely, and I'll take it from the floor. Yeah, perfect. How much time do we have, five, six minutes, is that good? Two or three minutes. Okay, good. Let's take the vote then from the floor. Following recent carbon treaties, including last year's climate agreement between the US and China, should oil exporters and international oil companies revise downwards their recoverable oil reserves. Very bold decision that we saw there between President Xi and President Obama, right? Working out of the box out of, uh, to kind of set the pace of the G2. Uh, yes or no? I don't need to repeat the question because of time. Let's go ahead and vote and get our sounds up on the board. No. <laughs> Not such a bold decision after all, right? Nobody's taking it quite into stride unless the rest of the world takes it on cue. Okay. Let's take one question from the floor. Sorry for the tight time, but we had a lot to cover in this. Any questions from the floor? Go on over here. I have a okay. Perfect. Okay. We'll come back to it. Who, where's the question? Sorry. Here. If we can get a microphone. And then I'm going to fi final thoughts from Prime Minister Senor. Um, I'm the ambassador of Denmark. I just uh, have a very brief comment, on also touching upon renewable energy. In, a, in just a few days, IRENA will have its annual meeting, the International Agency for Renewable Energy, here in Abu Dhabi. There's a World Future Energy Summit taking place the few days later. Uh, and I think that, obviously, what is happening with the oil market has an impact on, on renewable energy. It makes it more difficult and it probably slows down the introduction. Nevertheless, I think it's important to keep it in, in mind. Uh, a lot of uh, governments, especially in Europe, have locked in policies that will clearly uh, lead to a, uh, a long-term commitment or confirms a long-term commitment to uh, rely increasingly in renewables. I come from a country where 40% of the electricity is already produced by, uh, by wind. Germany is committed to doing th similar things and so on. So while I don't want to exaggerate it, I think it's part of the uh, formula, a very important part of the equation. And also in that connection, I would like to ma mention that there is one thing that could be used to even the playing field 
the way it's seen by some of the uh, uh, advocates of this, is to increase taxes, taxes on, on gasoline and oil and so on, to create long-term incentives to move towards more renewable. And this is very easy at a time when everybody is afraid of, uh, of uh, deflation. It, uh, even though people are a bit tired of high taxes, I think it's a, it's a method that could be used. And it's, uh, you know, when you have deflation, it's, it's, it's a tempting thing to do. And some governments are actually thinking about that at this time. So just, just that little comment and maybe Thank you. if somebody has responses. We Thank won't you. have time for response because I'm going to finish up with uh, Prime Minister Signora. Uh, having just come back from Italy and paid almost $8 a gallon for gasoline, I think the last thing that people want to see is higher taxes in Southern Europe right now. I'm sure Lord Howe was suggested, but that's an interesting point of debate to try to sustain renewables. I kind of read the comments from the minister, and I don't want to speak for him by any stretch of the imagination, but maybe this comfortable price is $70 to $80 a barrel, which maintains renewables going forward, uh, keeps the producers in the region happy, keeps the shale producers in the market except for the marginal ones. But uh, that's a point of debate for the next uh, Gulf Intelligence Conference. Final thoughts yes. uh, from the Prime Minister, please. And very quickly, of course. Yes. Thanks. I have a few comments, actually, to say. Again, back to the basics, is that uh, uh, we are going to witness in the coming years, definitely, a growth in demand, and definitely with the, with the technological innovations that has taken place, that has produced a new type of production, uh, with shale gas and other sources of energy. So all of this actually is going to uh, really, in one way or another, uh, require uh, adaptation to these, to these changes, particularly at the level of some of the oil producing countries and, and other countries. Because the continuation with this present policy without taking consideration that there are major changes that are taking place, definitely it's not going to be sustainable. I repeat that <clears throat> uh, the, the shale producers are going to dare to stay. Uh, their, their percentage share in the, in the market probably is unknown, but they are going to, be, to stay and be determining factor to some extent of what's going to be in the market. What is my really worry is uh, this by itself, with the adjustment and with the continued, definitely, lack of good governance, but without understating the importance of the role of the other problems that are being suffered by this part of the world, the continued of dictatorship on the one hand, the continued of unresolved problems like the Palestinian problem, which is a problem that runs deep in the conscience of all Arabs and all Muslims around the world. So this is, in fact, other, among other economic reasons, is driving uh, 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 the, the people in these, in these areas towards further radicalization, which is I'm really very, very much afraid of. Hence, something has to be done. Otherwise, uh, it is not only the people of this region is going to suffer. It's the whole world, actually. Uh, I'll, I'll just give an example. Nature has taught us a very important lesson, which is the bird's flu. You see, this bird's flu, they cross frontiers without any, any people checking them. Again, radicalization is something that has major impact, not only in this part of the world, but in the rest of the world. So one has to really be very careful about that. Paris, Australia, we've had a whole string of them as of late and, and fire. Thank you for finishing on your thoughts. Uh, Minister Mazuri, it's always a, a pleasure. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for the very precise analysis of fantastic mix on the panel. Nice round of applause for them and Diallo will come back up.